So my story um, is nonfiction, but it has a little bit of a fictional twist. Um, during the summer in the height of pand this pandemic, uh, I was finishing up this book on stoic wisdom that just came out about resilience. Um, but I hadn't uh, thought at all about this particular um, thing I had to be resilient about. The Stoics tell you that you're supposed to pre-rehearse baths and kind of uh, imagine them so you're living in the future and can kind of uh, anticipate worst, worst case scenarios. But I hadn't anticipated this one. So what was the scenario? Uh, the scenario was that my husband had been bicycling in our neighborhood, Rock Creek Park, here in the DC area and a deer could not figure out which way to cross the road. It went one way and then another way. And my husband being a very seasoned and uh, uh, experienced cyclist and a defensive one, zigged and zagged. But alas, he and the deer collided. Now the deer got away scot-free, you might say, without an injury. My husband, in this clash between cyclist and deer, was a loser, and he had seven broken ribs, a uh, dislocated shoulder, and a collapsed lung. So you have to imagine that um, we're in the middle of the pandemic. We hadn't really ventured out of our house, and now we were going to a major DC trauma center. And the doctor who... Uh, was on, the ER said, your husband took a really bad beating, which point I nearly fainted, wasn't being particularly stoic or resilient. <laughs> but uh, what was whispering in my ear were the words of one of the stoics I had just been writing about that week, who is Epictetus. He was enslaved around the time of Nero. And his notion was that you diminish pain because it's it's things are imagine things are out there and it's all your judgment about it so very willful control of how you see the external world and the and his mantra is it's only your body and i'm thinking only his body we have friends who are docs who are asking me flailed chest pulmonary functions how are they can he recognize you cognitive deficits aphasia memory problems and I'm thinking, you know, his brain is his body. Um, it's not just a psyche detached from, uh, from the body. So this set me thinking about modern stoicism. And I, I had known someone who had really in, in, endured uh, beatings. And that was um, he's Admiral Stockdale. Jim Stockdale is one of the military persons I interviewed. He was the senior POW in the Hanoi Hilton, the New York, uh, excuse me, the um, North Vietnamese um, prisoner of war camp. Um, he was in command over John McCain. And he had been shot down in 1965, roughly, and had at Stanford been given a very small book, Epictetus's Handbook, very popular these days, but popular then. And he memorized it in the Ticonderoga, the, the, the carrier. And when he was shot down, he said, five years down here, at least I'm leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. Well, I was thinking, as the doctor said, you know, he's taken a real beating. My husband's not a naval aviator, never trained to be a POW, which aviators do train to be, war, uh, war aviators at least. So how was I going to square this with this book I had been writing for the past year? The Stoics you know, famously minimize pain, but they also minimize or blur the distinction between bad luck, which is maybe being hit by a deer, but also what I teach and study, namely structural injustice, systemic injustice, and what my students have been living through um, these years um, as we've dealt with issues of racial reckoning on campus. So how do you sort of put a positive spin on that? Many in the wildly popular mega industry of, of popular stoicism do think that you can kind of accept and acquiesce that 
you can put a positive spin on many things and that you can see you're always seeing the world through lenses and so it's your estimate of the things out there that matter not some more objective consideration of how they matter but in that case the, the outer world fades away and you you know and you sort of retreat to this inner citadel and that is really maybe go it alone stoic grit but it's not what ancient stoicism is about about so what i try to do in the book and you know and where my real commitment is is to exposing the fact that the stoics the ancient stoics of the greek and roman period second century before the common era to after are really about thinking of how we're cosmopolitans that wasn't they didn't invent the term but they came close to popularizing it and and the idea that we're citizens of the world citizens of the cosmos um actually just as a side note the term comes up from this guy named the colorful figure diogenes the cynic who said i'm a citizen of everywhere nowhere there are no borders i'm a citizen of the world and so that's the first the first moment that term is coined of cosmopolitan and marcus aurelius who's often pictured as this bronze and equestrian alone on a a horse he writes in the, in the what would become the meditations if you've ever seen a, a dismembered body the limbs strewn apart from the trunk of the body that's what a human being makes of itself when you cut yourself off from each other and i take that really seriously that marcus aurelius who many view as the sort of the tough marlboro man maybe he really was talking about how we're connected he was writing on a battlefield and he really had the image of of a severed person in mind and he's saying that's what we are if we cut ourselves off from the rest of humanity so the stoics have this idea you can't be at home in the world unless you're connected to each other and another stoic has this idea that we're you know a series of concentric circles and you bring the outermost the furthest person in humanity a, 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 a first person across the globe into your home that's the language so that you can um, make them akin. That's really how it goes. So I was sort of thinking about all this this year in teaching in a really hard year and, and in writing this book, a hard year of isolation, of reckoning with injustice, of hate and fear and rage and anger tearing us apart. And the idea of popular stoicism is a kind of self-retreat, um, self-mastery, because you can't master the world, just gets it wrong. And I was actually rethinking Seneca a lot. I mean, he's not hes not always the best figure. He was the speech writer and an apologist at times for Nero, but he, he, you know, he, he was in it, you know, in imperial intrigue and other things. But he also knew that anger is, and hatred are the enemy and he spoke about using what a lot of silicon valley call life hacks not just to dispel your own fears but to dispel ways in which you see impulsively or feel impulsively where you're not really assessing what's out there rationally but you see it through distorted lens or bias he doesn't use the word bias but he does you have the idea that you're distorting or perverting the cognitions. And so I think that's not self-help, but rather group help. It's a way of rethinking how we see the world so that we understand what are the sort of the prejudices and the biases through which we see others. And we, and we really see others as out there, different, alien, and not fellow human beings. And so the Stoics were so popular because they, I mean, through the ages, they were picked up through the Judeo-Christian tradition. They're contemporaneous with that. They're picked up by the Renaissance. They're picked up by the Enlightenment. They're picked up by the founding fathers of this country because they believed in shared reason, that we all 
belong to the commonwealth of humanity through shared reason. And Stoic philosophy is sort of captured, I think, terrifically by um, Seneca, who says at the very end of On Anger, this wonderful treatise, he says, let us cultivate humanity. And essentially that's the rallying call for if, if the Stoics, for this idea, if the Stoics are worth reading, it's because they exhort us to rise to our fullest potential through reason, cooperation, and, you know, and a sense of selflessness when it's required. So that selflessness was very much on my mind in this ER room and in the trauma center um, when a team of doctors, you know, in full um, gear, COVID um, gear, were treating my husband. Um, he came away pretty, you know, pretty good. He never heard from me. The Deer's insurance co company, the Deer in this fateful collision of Buck and Man, clearly uh, won, you know, my husband didn't. But at the very end of his healing process, he began to think about getting on a bike again. And, you know, this is a guy that had written for the, Boston's real paper, the pothole of the week column years and years and years ago. So he knew what it was to fall, but he was ready to get on again. And I, 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 I sought counsel from our grown children. And I said, what do you think? You know, should dad get on it, the bike again? And our son-in-law himself, uh, a pilot, an aviator said, I'm not so sure. And so then we said, what do you think about a Peloton? And the pilot said, I think it's a great idea very little risk of hitting a deer on a peloton so <laughs> i'll end on that note note the deer versus the cyclist i think the cyclist actually came out okay peloton has become our friend and um whether we're stoic or not about it we certainly have been resilient through this period of time <laughs>